Thank you for joining us tonight. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you for joining us tonight for the opening night of the third international Israeli apartheid week. This week's events in New York City began Saturday with a discussion of grassroots nonviolent resistance in Palestine. Events throughout the week will cover digital resistance among Palestinian youth, a film and discussion on Israeli discriminatory marriage laws, strategy sessions on the boycott divestment sanctions campaign, an exhibition of young photographers from Balata refugee camp, a teach-in on Palestine solidarity work, and a closing event on challenging Israeli apartheid. Full schedules are available in the back. Uh, Israeli Apartheid Week began in Toronto, Canada in February of 2004. Receiving much media attention and including notable speakers such as Ilan Pape, Uri Davis, and Karman Abulsi, the event attracted six more universities in 2005. This year, college campuses in Oxford, Cambridge, and London are joined by student and community activists in Toronto, Hamilton, Montreal, Ottawa, and New York City. The aim of these events is to contribute to a growing public discussion of Israel as a settler colonial state, comparable to states like South Africa and our very own United States. Apartheid Week brings together academics and activists who hold differing political positions but are in agreement on placing Israel in a historical genealogy of settler colonialism. This broader historical context allows solidarity activists in North, Am in North America, Europe, and beyond to draw on the experiences of the boycott divestment sanctions campaign that was central to the anti-apartheid movement in the 70s and 80s. It was at that moment that a spirit of collective responsibility and a series of broad campaigns compelled nations to take actions against South Africa. Organizers of Israeli Apartheid Week throughout the weeks of the year are mobilizing around the boycott divestment sanctions campaign. Uh, information on the BDS campaign is available in the back. And, and these campaigns have made substantial gains. The BDS campaign is an effective tool that we'll be discussing more tonight and throughout the week. And it is particularly important because it represents and responds to a set of demands listed in a July 2005 statement of over 170 Palestinian grassroots and political organizations. The demands therein are the full equality for Arab Palestinian citizens in Israel, an end to the occupation and colonization of the West Bank and Gaza, and the implementation of the right of return and compensation for Palestinian refugees according to UN Resolution 194. Whether by drawing an, an analogy to the South African experience of apartheid or to the Native American experience of dispossession, expulsion, and genocide in North America, the time has long come to place Palestine-Israel in a broader historical struggle for social justice. What is happening in Palestine, Israel, is not a complex, exceptional, or 2,000-year religious, religious conflict. It is, rather, a modern phenomenon. It is a colonial conflict that follows the standard historical pattern of military occupation, the appropriation of land and resources, and the denial of the basic right of self-determination. Zionist colonial power, in coordination with British colonialism and more recently U.S. empire, have developed sophisticated technologies of control and oppression in Palestine for the last 100 years. These mechanisms have included ethnic cleansing, expulsion, house demolitions, targeted assassinations, mass imprisonment, a relentless occupation, and most recently, one of the largest separation walls in modern history. Alongside these technologies, the expansion and redefinition of struggle, resistance, and survival have persisted unabated. As many have pointed out, the history of Palestinian resistance is a long one that we can date in the late 19th century 
with the rise of the Zionist settlement enterprise in Palestine through the guerrilla revolt of the mid-30s, the struggle against expulsion and dispossession in 48, the birth of a national liberation movement in the late 60s in the language of contemporary Algerian and Latin American anti-colonial struggles, the rise of a grassroots social and political revolution in the West Bank and Gaza in the 80s, and more recent forms of armed resistance. But flanking these moments of official political resistance is a longer and lesser known history of everyday struggle. Palestinians resist every day in crossing a checkpoint, standing disrobed in front of the Israeli occupying forces, transgressing the wall, going to school, fulfilling a workday, or returning home unscathed. Some today describe South Africa's apartheid system as having been a political anomaly, a contemporary country caught in the morals of imperial Europe. But is institutionalized racism and the complete control over economic, political, and social systems by one group of people over another such an anomaly in our contemporary moment? Tonight we gather to stand in solidarity with Palestinians as they face an ever-shrinking Palestine riddled by Bantustans, bypass roads, and checkpoints. We are honored to have among us a group of speakers who bring with them a broad range of knowledge and experience and a commitment to social justice in Palestine, North America, and beyond. Our invited speakers will speak individually followed by an open discussion on the usefulness of the apartheid analogy for Palestine-Israel, its relevance, its limitations, and the way forward. So I'm just going to introduce each of our speakers individually, and I'm going to ask everyone to um, hear, hear them out. We're going to open discussion after each of our speakers speak. And um, there are organizers in the room with white um, bandanas around their arms if you need any information or help. So our first speaker tonight is Bashir Abumani, who teaches English at Barnard College and is a regular commentator on Palestine on the web source Zenet. Please welcome him. Thanks, um, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. I think this is a very important event. It's about time that it's, it came to New York. Um, this kind of activity, solidarity with the Palestinian cause, has been far too neglected in Palestinian history. Um, the PLO, the PLO elite, was always much more concerned with diplomatic support. It wasn't concerned with mass popular support um, in Western countries, in the US. And I think, uh, fundamentally, this is where the Palestinian cause should lie, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly. I'm going to try to not take up the 15 minutes that I have. Uh, the talk is organized into two parts. The first part is about the analogy, is about the settler colonial uh, nature of Israel. And the second part is about the specific Palestinian response to the settler colonial project. And I'll conclude with some thoughts as a way of just beginning a discussion. In order to understand the Arab-Israeli conflict, the Palestinian question, the initial point of analysis has to be the fact, the nature of Zionism itself. Zionism is a very specific kind of nationalism, it's a settler, settler colonial nationalism that has three, I would say, distinctive features. I'll use the number three just for uh, convenience sake. There are many other features but three are very significant. The first feature is that Zionism, as a settler colonial nationalism, is premised on the conquest not only of land, but of labor as well. So the, it combines, it's a kind of project that combines settlements with uh, pioneering and immigration, leaving no place for the Palestinian indigenous population within its structures within either its political structures or its economic structures. So Zionism excluded Palestinians from the beginning, expelled them. It didn't seek to exploit them. It's a very important distinction. 
as a settler colonial nationalism. There's a moment in Palestinian history and Israeli history where there's a partial exception to that rule in the period from 1967 up until 1991 when Zionism actually actively exploited the Palestinian population other than the ones who remained inside Israel as migrant daily labor. But from 1991, as a result of the Intifada and as a result of Israeli repression, Rabin instituted a policy of closure before any suicide bombings took place inside Israel in 1991. So that period is a partial exception to the natural uh, logic of Zionism. It's, it's exclusionary nature. So for Zionism, Palestinians are superfluous as a population. They're dispensable. There's something you need to get rid of. The second main feature, distinctive feature of Zionism, is that the main instrument of conquest, of the conquest of Palestine, was not capital. This was not a capitalist colonization of Palestine. Actually, the capitalist colonization of Palestine failed. What was distinctive about Zionism was that it was labor organizations, the, the so-called second aliyah, that led to and ultimately brought about 1948. So it was labor organizations, not capital, that ended up colonizing Palestine. So Zionism combines the interest of Jewish labor with Jewish capital, with Jewish capital under the leadership of a, very, of a nationalist bureaucratic elite. So what we get in Zionism is national primacy that stifles class conflict internally, silences dissent and internal democracy, and sidelines, very importantly, even within the community, the values of social solidarity and egalitarianism. The nature of this project also has things to tell us about whether there is room within Zionism or as a result of Zionism for cross-national, if you like, uh, workers' organizations. The fact that the distinctive features of Zionism meant the fact that it was labor organizations, the room for cross-national solidarities with Palestinian workers was very small, if not insignificant historically. So that the main contradiction was a national contradiction. It was a national antagonism. Israel develops as a colonial national state where colonialism is central both to state formation and nation building and creates a society in which the allocation of power, rights, and privileges exclusively benefit the colonizing people. The third feature to keep in mind today is that the Jewish state was purposefully and necessarily at the time, historically, conceived by Herzl as a, quote, rampart of Europe against Asia, an outpost of, civil of civilization as opposed to barbarism. The, as it were, imperial alliance dimension of Zionism. And this meant that without British imperial support, there would be no Israel. Very simple. Without US imperial support and subsidy, there wouldn't be an occupation. It's fairly uncontroversial. Israel was massively aided and supported, not only to pursue its own colonizing project, but also to perform a function, to, perform, uh, to bring about Western objectives. The crucial thing to remember is that Israel was utilized in this way from the beginning. 1950, we can name the years, when Israel, the, the main dimension of Israeli intervention has been an anti-national dimension, to crush, at the beginning, secular Arab nationalism, 1956 against Nasser, 1967 against Arab nationalism, including Nasser, 1982 against the secular PLO, where it crushed it and ejected it from, from Beirut, and the second dimension, the ongoing project, where it converges with, national, with imperial interests in the region, is it, 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 it's, its attempt to crush Islamic nationalism. Hezbollah, the summer, Hamas is another example. Now, what this meant for the Palestinians can simply be put, be put in the following terms. That effectively, the destruction of Palestinian society in Palestine. The dispossession of Palestinians, their expulsion, their subordination and domination. The founding of the State of Israel, important to remember, equals the denial of Palestinian self-determination. And I would argue even the partition plan was a denial of Palestinian self-determination. The majority of Palestinians didn't want. So Palestinian nationalism historically either sought to stop immigration and land colonization in the 30s, the 40s, or later on rectify 1948, return Palestinians to their homes, destroyed villages and, and cities, 
and or rectify 1967, the added compounded uh, part of the catastrophe, which is the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, to attempt to reverse the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. These are the three or four things that, uh, in which Palestinian nationalism focused historically. Since the arrival of Zionism to Palestine, Palestinians, in a sense, have tried in one form or another, and we can talk about that in the discussion, if you like, to decolonize Palestine, i.e. end colonial privileges being heaped exclusively on Jews in Palestine, and end the pal Palestinian marginalization on, and exclusion. This has been one of the important tenets of Palestinian nationalism. In, in post-1948 Palestinian nationalism, there have been effectively three plans, three strategies, in which to tackle uh, the Zionist colonization of Palestine, to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli question. Some more justly, some less, but there have been three broad strategies. The first plan, historically speaking, and I'll go through them historically, was the one-state solution, effectively saying that we will, the Palestinians will work for equal citizenship for all people on Palestine, in all of Palestine. This plan was effective politically from the late 60s on to the early 70s. That period was very crucial for, for, for the one-state solution. And it comes to be discussed again in the 90s, in the period after the failure of Oslo, the capitulation of Palestinian nationalism, many intellectuals or some intellectuals uh, end up believing that the one-state solution is, should again be the solution that is pursued by Palestinians. This is for the one-state solution. The second important Palestinian response is what you can broadly put under the, the, the heading of a socialist revolutionary response, whereby Palestinians would become the vanguards of Arab democracy and re revolution in the Middle East and would overturn corrupt and authoritarian regimes, Arab regimes, as a way of gaining Arab mass support to liberate Palestine. The logic of this implies that Palestinians themselves wouldn't be able to liberate all of Palestine and that they would need ma mass support for that so that they would contribute and work together with their Arab brethren to overturn the regimes that are standing in the way as obstacles to liberating Palestine. That you can put very broadly under the revolutionary option. The final outcome of this project was a socialist state in the Arab East. A socialist state that would guarantee the rights of self-determination for minorities in the Middle East, including uh, Jewish Israeli, uh, Kurds, uh, Southern Sudanese. That, that was broadly conceived in, in, in those terms. Imperialism in the region would be no more. This was one of the fundamental premises of the second part, uh, the second option. This option was bathed in blood in Black September in 1970-1971. It was crushed by Arab reactionary regimes, supported by the West. So effectively, Arab reaction liquidated a potential possible Arab-Palestinian revolution. The third option comes, follows on from the events of Black September in 1970-71. The two-state solution comes to be supported by Fatah, by it's the majority solution these days. A majority of Palestinians support a two-state solution. It's later on accepted by all factions, including all the factions that re rejected it before, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, now implicitly Hamas. What's interesting about the two-state solution is that it follows on the heels of Black September. It follows on the heels of the crushing of the Palestinians as a potential revolutionaries in the Middle East. After that, in 1974, the Palestinians effectively accept, politically, to create a state, the state of Palestine, on any part of liberated Palestine, effectively meaning the West Bank and Gaza. This is ratified in Algiers in 1998. So from 74 to 1988, the Palestinians implicitly, had there been willingness in Israel and willingness in the West, importantly, would have accepted creating a state in the West Bank and Palestine and ending the occupation. In 1998, this is ratified, and this becomes the official PLO position as a, as a response to the First Intifada. The PLO, of course, also does more than that, very problematically, I think. It also renounces terrorism, and it also recognizes the state of Israel. So the victims have to recognize their executioners and their right to exist, not the reverse. This is one of the American dictates of it, in order not to give them the West Bank and Gaza as a state, but only to start talking to them. This was part of the uh, 
ongoing problem that came to be called Oslo. The two-state solution is effectively the international consensus over Palestine. Everybody accepts the division of Palestine on a two-state solution other than Israel and, and, and the US. The whole world effectively accepts it. Oslo didn't realize the two-state solution. In fact, Oslo gutted. It gutted the two-state solution, leaving the West Bank and Gaza with more settlements and settlers, doubling the amounts of settlements and settlers, more oppression and domination for the Palestinians, no sovereignty, no state, and no independence. On top of that, Palestinians are today cut off from each other and from Israel, left totally at the mercy of Israel, totally dependent on Israel, and effectively what you can call, this is why we need a new language, apartheid is very important as a term morally, but we need a new language to describe what's happening on the ground in Israel, effectively in collective open air prisons. The main contradiction, the main struggle in Palestinian politics today is not, as it may seem in the West or amongst the diaspora, the one between the one state or the two state. There is no contradiction on that front. The main contradiction in Palestinian politics is between those capitulators amongst the PA elite who are ready to accept whatever Israel is ready to give them and the ones who want to hold to the actual real two-state solution who still hold to, an, to the international consensus on Palestine and the Palestinian consensus of ending the occupation of 1967, dismantling all of the settlements which are illegal, founding a Palestinian state sovereign and independent in the West Bank and Gaza as a way, and importantly, of beginning to resolve the Palestinian question, of beginning to resolve the Palestinian question. What this majority popular nationalist trend in Palestinian society recognizes is that Palestinians now are too weak to be able to decolonize all of Palestine and practice their right of return to Israel itself, but that they may well still be capable of reversing the occupation and defeating expansionist Zionism. This is the basis today of Palestinian unity, politically on the ground. And it is here, I believe, that the most urgent, most crucial struggle for the Palestinian cause lies, both against our own domestic capitulators and against Israeli brutality and dehumanizing practices and, and imperial support for that. To achieve a Palestinian initial, and I, I emphasize initial and minimum victory against Zionism, Palestinians need a solidarity movement that is both realistic and also quite cunning. Cunning enough to recognize that before anything else can take place, before anything else can take place, Israel needs to be hit and hit hard where it can be hurt most politically, and that is the 67 occupation. This is our only real political lever. There's a political lever. This is our only real political lever of beginning the process of Palestinian, of decolonizing Palestine. A lever of pressure against Zionism today. And if, if with our Palestinian diaspora, with our Arab brothers, our Jewish and Israeli supporters, our solidarity movement in the West, we push hard and long enough then maybe, maybe we can also convince Israelis that the most just and lasting solution is one based on the universal values of equality, mutuality, and reciprocity. But the lever has to be the occupation. But again, in order to get there, we first need to defeat Israel in 1967 and reverse its occupation. If we opt to forego this necessary and popular struggle, then we replace politics with something else idealism, wishful thinking, whatever you want to call it. We risk prolonging rather than alleviating Palestinian suffering, and we risk creating a solidarity movement that preaches to the wretched of Palestine rather than one that is genuinely involved in aiding both occupied and refugee Palestinians to express their own democratic choices and pursue, to pursue the realization of their national rights, including the right of return. So I'll end with these thoughts. What I believe Palestinians need at the present moment, and this is what they've expressed since the first Antifada and now with the, uh, the prisoner's document, is a new nationalism. One that mobilizes all Palestinians, refugees occupied and those within Israel, as active participants in the making of their own history, not as spectators. We, we look on as handshakes are being uh, dealt and given. Not as spectators, but as participants. And a nationalism that aims to, to satisfy the needs and interests of the majority of Palestinians, those of return 
of self-determination and of individual liberty and social justice. That's the kind of nationalism that's required in Palestine. Only through mass participation and collective self-organization can Palestinians guarantee that their rights won't again be denied or again be sown down the river. Thank you. Thank you, Bashir. Uh, we'd like to also welcome now uh, Mr. Robert Rabidou, who is a member of the White Earth Ojibwa Spirit Lake Lakota Tribal Nation. He is a 35-year member of the American Indian Movement, a co-defendant of Leonard Peltier, an ex-political prisoner, and current co-director of the Leonard Peltier Defense Committee. Please welcome him. Good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> I normally don't prepare a presentation, but this time uh, it was necessary because these are important questions that uh, have been put before us and uh, they require some exact, or at least some historical perspectives. Let me see if I can get this up here. Uh, uh, technology. First, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here today. It is my hope that my small bite of North American Indian history will give this conference some meaningful contribution to the defense of the occupied and dispossessed Palestinian people. The question of Israel as an apartheid state, namely a state which regulates racism and law through acts of imperialism, has arisen here. And I have been asked to provide a small portion of North American Indian history as a comparison model. Apartheid of South Africa is a close model to the method which was instituted in Israel, colonization of Palestine. But the original model for apartheid arose in North America in the early 1800s. When the Indian reservation system was created, there can be no question that apartheid in the Bantu system of South Africa was created from the long-tested North American Indian Reservation system. Just as the discovery of gold in the Black Hills of South Dakota had brought hordes of white miners rushing into the plains, sparking the Indian Wars, diamonds discovered in South Africa around 1900 resulted in an English invasion resulting in the Boer War. Today, the question of how Israel has gone about its work to colonize and oppress the Palestinian people has once again opened the door to the methodology used by imperialists who imprison nations of people for the purpose of exploitation. European colonizers target the exploitation of the abundance of natural resources, including fertile farmlands and unique mineral resources in both South Africa and North America, and today have target, targeted the Arabian Peninsula. The apartheid law of 1948 in South Africa were similar to those that had emerged through the 1887 Allotment Act, authorizing the president to survey Native American tribal land and divide the area into allotments. For the individual Native American, it was through this act that racial discrimination was institutionalized. Racism touched every aspect of social life, sanctioning containment, just as the South Africans would be in 1948. All Native American Indians were racially classified into three categories, full bloods, mixed bloods, white, 
for the purpose of valued rights or claims of any person to Indian lands. The act divided existing reservation areas into 160 acre plots, one plot for each head of household. The practical results of this act were that some 60 million acres of treaty land, almost half, were open to white settlement. The result of racial classification into three categories were based on their appearance, social acceptance, and tribal descent. Laws were passed forbidding Native American Indians access to sectors of Euro-American social life. If their appearance is white, she, he was socially accepted as white by the colonizers and could freely move about. But if the appearance was Indian, she, he was ostracized from Euro-American society, similar to the apartheid race laws forbidden black people from social sectors of their colonizers. Apartheid means separateness a system of racial segregation that was enforced in South Africa from 1948 to 1994. It was designed to form a legal framework for continued economic and political dominance by the English and Dutch. Territorial separation was enforced by police repression. The black majority in particular legally became citizens of a particular homeless homelands that were nominally sovereign nations that operated similar to the United States reservation systems. Racism is a basic motivation for separation and containment. Separation is a basic way used to oppress and control a targeted group of people. From the beginning, Europeans have systematically stolen lands through various methods, including policies of genocide to remove Native Americans from their traditional lands. Primarily gathering and hunting people, the reservation system ensured white control over the political and economic existence of Native American Indians. Racism includes the process of criminalization and fear to justify the invader's act of removing and segregating the targeted group of people. A propaganda campaign to build fear and hysterical sentiment towards the targeted group is set in motion to assist in achieving the final objective of removal and segregation. These groups of people are no longer seen as human beings. Instead, it is taught to view and fear them as savages and are terrorists. The racism and systematic force relocation of a targeted group of people is characterized by land theft and control of their destinies, humili humiliation and murder. In 1830, North American Indian men, women, and children were taken from their traditional lands in the East, herded into temporary prisons with little food, then forced to march 1,000 miles west to an area labeled Indian Country. The relocation became known as the Trail of Tears. More than 70,000 Native people from different tribes in the East were relocated. About 4,000 Cherokees died on the march as a result of this removal from the traditional homelands. In 1889, the United States Congress passed the Indians' Appropriation Bill, proclaiming that unassigned lands, quote unquote, that had been designated Indian country, quote unquote, were part of the public domain and open to white settlement. It wasn't long until the Native American Indian tribes that had been displaced from their traditional homes in the East were again forced to give up the land that they had been relocated to. This time they were relocated to reservations. In 1907, Indian country, quote unquote, became the 46th state of the United States, Oklahoma. The reservation system in North America set up barriers 
between Euro-Americans and North American Indian people that would ensure the greatest portion and best lands fell to the control of white Europeans. By the late 1800s, Euro-Americans succeeded in confining more than 500 tribal nations to small portions of their traditional homelands, which included the entire North American continent. While in many other cases, two and more tribal groups were forced to coexist on a single land base. These are known as confederated tribes. Reservations were originally set up to contain and control Native American Indian people, while Euro-Americans swept up the land for themselves. Israel has imposed the same containment with Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank. Today, we are free to leave our reservations and come and go as we please. However, just as it has been made illegal for the Palestinians to freely move about, it was illegal for an Indian to leave the reservation. We were once considered illegal aliens off the reservation. Originally, an Indian agent and army garrison were deployed to each reservation site to control and to ensure the containment of tribal members. Israel enforces a very similar containment policy against the Palestinians. But the Indian problem, quote unquote, still remained because we were still united tribally and culturally and continued to resist giving up our lands, culture, and values just as the Palestinian pe people resist today. With the passage of time, additional congressional acts were imposed on Native American Indians designed to, for ethnic cleansing and the maintenance of colonization and exploitation. The Termination Act and Relocation Act were intended to drive what remained of North American Indians into extinction by forcing them off reservations and into the Euro-American melting pot. In 1884, the Court of Indian Offenses was established so that Indians could deal with crimes that took place in their own land which took the appearance of being sovereign. One year later, the Major Crimes Act was passed giving the United States authority over certain serious, quote unquote, crimes, not only did this act further weaken Indian authority over themselves and their land, it opened the way for the United States to reoccupy Native American lands, ushering back in controls. First giving the U.S. Army authority to control policing of reservations, then the Bureau of Indian Affairs, BIA today, it is the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, and the BIA that has the authority to police reservations. The European manufactured idea of, manufa of manifest destiny, giving them a quote unquote, God given right to rid themselves of the savages, quote unquote, and terrorists, so that civilization can flourish was and continues to be used for the justification of killing and segregating targeted groups of people like the Palestinians. Manifest de destiny was an invented lie that Euro-Americans embraced that led to the removal and segregation of Native American Indians people and the expansion of Euro-American territory. This lie that resulted in the acquisition of territory for the expansion of what today is called the United States was the direct cause of tremendous death, destruction, and suffering for Native American people who had, acted, who had occupied this vast territory of North America for tens of thousands of years. The penalties imposed against freedom fighters, even nonviolent protests, have been severe. Some were sentenced to death. In 1862, 303 Santi Lakotas who had escaped the reservation were set to be hung. But President Lincoln 
was concerned with how Europeans would view such a mass hanging, whom he was afraid were about to enter the Civil War on the side of the South, ordered instead that only 39 of the 303 be hung. Many were imprisoned, many for life, like Nelson Mandela and Leonard Peltier. In 2006, a pre-dawn raid on a Palestinian family, a mother and her four children were imprisoned for three months by Israel immigration officials for being in Israel illegally after having their application for amnesty denied. Israel, with the assistance of the United States, justifies their wrongful and deceiving actions to remove and isolate Palestinians as merely carrying out God's will, quote unquote. Despite agreements signed by, with the Palestinians, Israel continues to maintain an occupation force on Palestinian land, just as the United States government continues to maintain an occupational force to control reservations through the Major Crimes Act and the BIA. To this day, all Indian lands are maintained under the jurisdiction of the United States government and the state governments. Zionists claim Israel was given to them by God, quote unquote, and that their race possessed some, quote unquote, natural superiority. In the United States, your Americans claim the same and teach their future generations to pray homage to the gangsters and outlaws and thieves who stole this country from Indian nations in the name of God. In reference to 20 years of denied human and civil rights of the Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, Reverend Alan Bosak of South Africa said, at a Palestinian human rights campaign in reference to apartheid, quote unquote, oppression in Palestine is so very much like the oppression in my homeland. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Robert. I'd like now to introduce Ifat Suskin, who is the Communications Director of MADRE, the International Women's Human Rights Organization. She has appeared in print and online publications such as CommonDreams.org, TomPain.com, Foreign Policy in Focus, and The W Effect, Bush's War on Women. She's also been featured as a commentator on CNN, National Public Radio, and BBC. Please welcome Ifat. Hi, thanks. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, I think that uh, when we are thinking about the usefulness of the apartheid analogy to Israel and Palestine, that it's important to ask ourselves how much that language of apartheid illuminates and explains for people and how much it sort of confounds and, and obscures. Um, because for, for us as, as political activists, and I'm trying to, to, to think of us as a kind of emerging anti-apartheid movement and think about some of the questions that we need to be facing and, and some of the perspectives that we need to have in our minds, I think that um, it's very important to recognize that that language is above all for us a, a teaching tool and that if we can't come up with powerful and also accurate language to describe the reality that we're trying to change, we're, we're at, a, at a deficit. Um, so that's one thing I think to keep in mind. For, for me, the, my introduction to the, the use of the term apartheid in Israel came from people who I felt to be a very authoritative source and those were uh, uh, white South African Jews who had been active in the anti-apartheid movement uh, in South Africa and were living in exile in Israel where a lot of them had shifted their energies to combating Israeli occupation. And this was the spring of 1993, so Rabin, who was the Prime Minister then, had just imposed the closure. And um, Bashir described, described this policy that, that really decimated the Palestinian economy after it had been, been made dependent on people being able to work inside of Israel. They were barred from doing that and also barred from being in Jerusalem, which was the political and financial and, and cultural and religious capital. Um, 
and that policy really has become, you know, since then, a, a way of life in the occupied territories, what, what some Israeli activists have called the part of the, the matrix of control, a, a whole set of policies, um, Israeli policies, that really circumscribe and, and embitter Palestinian life. Um, in Israel, for a time, the, that set of policies was um, known under the label um, uh, hafrada. Hafrada in Hebrew means separation, and the term in Afrikaans for separation is apartheid. So based in part on that coincidence um, and on also on some of the implications that we saw in the closure policy back in 93, a group of us who were political activists in Jerusalem decided to mount a campaign in West Jerusalem, the Jewish-Israeli part of the city, um, called Closure Equals Apartheid. And we approached our South African friends to see what they thought of using that slogan. And most of them, to their horror, thought that it was uh, very appropriate. Um, in 1995, I um, helped to publish a pamphlet about the impact of the closure policies on Palestinian families in Hebron. And it was called Apartheid in Hebron, the true face of Oslo. This was during the Oslo years, the, the years of the so-called peace process between Israel and the Palestinian leadership. Um, and we, we produced the pamphlet in Hebrew and English and Arabic, and we got quite varied responses from uh, people who spoke those three different languages, which I think were, were very telling. You know, it's, I guess, not surprising that most Arabic speakers sort of cheered the analogy, um, especially people in Hebrew, which at the time was sort of a microcosm of what we've since seen take shape in the territories, right? There has always been, since 67, when the occupation began, a separate legal system for Israeli settlers in the territories and Palestinians who live there. But now, under the banner of peace in the 90s, they built this whole separate road network just for the Israeli settlers and Jewish tourists. Um, and, um, and as Shireen described, Palestinian areas and neighborhoods got divided and subdivided by, you know, big chunks of, by these roads and by big chunks of, of Jewish settlements in ways that were reminding more and more people of the Bantustans uh, in South Africa. Um, but a lot of Israelis who read the pamphlets, as people on the left who would be caught dead reading a pamphlet called Apartheid in Hebrew in the first place, um, people who were, you know, committed to ending the occupation, um, they, um, they thought the apartheid analogy was, was totally unfair. They thought it was extreme. They thought it was inaccurate. This was in 1995. Within a very short number of years, people in the center and main mainstream of the Israeli peace movement had picked up that language of apartheid. People like Meron Benvenisti, who's a former mayor of Jerusalem. People like Shulamit Aloni, who's a very longtime Israeli parliamentarian. Um, and that's, you know, very, very different um, than here in the U.S., you know, where, where this apartheid language continues to be associated with an extreme left position, an anti-Israel position. You know, we've just seen, seen Jimmy Carter getting slammed uh, these past few months for saying things that mainstream Israeli newspapers have been saying for years. You know, in Israel, people, like, can't quite figure out what the big deal is because it's reality. Um, and it's troubling, I think, that that l lack of awareness um, uh, about um, these, the, the appropriateness of the apartheid analogy to Israel in this country because these are not only Israeli policies, these are U.S. policies. You know, this Jewish-only road network that's been built in the West Bank was funded 100% with U.S. tax dollars as part of the Y River Accord uh, signed in 1998. And, um, you know, so people in this country are, are very heavily implicated in um, all of these policies. And that's something that's understood pretty much everywhere in the world, except for here. Um, there's another important difference, I think, between Israeli and U.S. Uh, perceptions of, of apartheid and, and the use of the term and, and how people understand the, that set of policies, which is that in the U.S., people... Um, defend, you know, the closure, the separation bar barrier, the ID card system, um, the bypass roads, all of these things as necessary to Israel's security. And that is the official government line in Israel. But inside Israeli society, by and large, people, people know better. People know, for example, that the idea of creating you know, a, a firewall between Israel and the occupied territories is, is a fantasy. I mean, 
you know, I know a lot of people, including myself, who have, you know, snuck back and forth across those Israeli checkpoints with Palestinian colleagues, and these, you know, none of us have military training. It's just, you know, any big national border that size, no matter how heavily militarized, is not impermeable, you know, and you can see that in Texas and Arizona, and you can see it, you know, in, in Israel and Palestine. So, you know, it's just, it's just not real. Um, the, um, you know, there's, even if the, the official government line is that those are, are security measures, it's acknowledged in Israeli society, including in public discussions, in the parliament, in the press, um, that there's a broader aim to um, these, the set of policies that we're identifying as apartheid policies. And the broader aim really is to maintain the Jewish character of the state, this precious demographic majority. Israeli politicians are constantly talking about the demographic majority. And what they want, um, and we know this because you know one Israeli prime minister after the next gets up and says it very clearly, what they want is control over the land and the resources of the occupied territories, but they don't want the, the population, the Palestinian population of the occupied territories, because then Israel would not have a Jewish majority. And that, for Israelis, really is, is the heart of the matter. Um, you know, ultimately, Israelis are going to have to make a choice about whether they want to live in an exclusive ethnic religious state or whether they want to live in a democracy, because those two things are, are at odds. Um, and I think that, you know, you should know that, <laughs> that at the moment, the vast majority of Jewish Israelis are extremely committed to maintaining this exclusive ethnic religious state and all of the privileges that that affords them. Um, but I think that for us as, as an anti-apartheid movement, um, it's important to keep sight of the fact that, you know, that that can change. Um, and, and I guess that's the point at which we need to be able to be both, uh, you know, visionary and realistic at the same time, which is not always easy to do. You know, you have to be visionary to be able to imagine and bring into being a situation that doesn't currently exist. You know, that's, that's the work of social change, whatever you're, you're working on. But also you have to be able to be realistic. And on this count, I think there's actually, you know, cause for optimism because, the truth is, if you look at history, these kinds of things can change really, really quickly. Um, you know, Israel went from a situation in which, within a span of just a few years, it was illegal to display the colors of the Palestinian flag. You know, any, any expression of Palestinian nationalism was totally criminalized to a situation where the prime minister was negotiating with the leadership of the PLO and the majority of the population was in favor of a Palestinian state albeit on their own terms, but you know, still it's like in terms of public opinion, that's a really big shift and it happened very quickly. You know, look at, at South Africa in the mid-1980s, no sane person thought that Nelson Mandela, who was a convicted terrorist, was gonna be not just out of jail, but elected president, you know, within a decade. And that happened. So, you know, the bottom line I think is that, you know, if, if apartheid was ended in South Africa, it can be ended also in Israel and Palestine, and I think that we need to ask, you know, what it would take, what would it take to persuade the majority of Israelis to go down that road that white South Africans took, because, and to renounce their apartheid state. You know, South Africans also always claimed, until 1994, that apartheid was a matter of survival. That was central to their, their justification. Um, you know, what changed in 1994 was not the terms of survival for white South Africans. What changed was that up until the anti-apartheid movement had reached a kind of critical mass of, of impact, white South Africans saw the best guarantor of their interests, you know, their economic and political and social interests as, as apartheid. And once the anti-apartheid movement made apartheid just too costly for white South Africans, people saw that the best way to guarantee their economic and social and political interests was to end apartheid, and they, they did that. Um, and I think that it's, it's, you know, it's possible to imagine, but also important to kind of chart out a, a comparable um, trajectory for Israel, and that's where you know, all this, these different kinds of, of strategies and activism that, that uh, you guys were talking about really need to come into play and, and, and be developed. And I think that uh, we're gonna need to, to face a lot of the same questions that the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa faced. And um, you know, we can talk more about that in the discussion if there's time, but I wanna suggest in closing one question that for me is really an overarching one, and that is how do we, how do we uh, create strategies that not just combat and tear down Israeli occupation and Israeli apartheid, but at the same time build the kind of world that we wanna 
live in and that we want to see in that part of the world and, and in general. So I'll close there. So thanks. There's not much more for me to say, actually. So I could just fold, fold up here and go away. But I'll try to add a few things. Uh, beginning with the, obser with the observation that any discussion of the question of apartheid in Israel and Palestine today, in the U.S., that is, must begin by pointing out that anyone who bothers to wade through the torrent of abuse directed at President Carter for having published his book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid, would find not one single attempt to engage with, let alone to refute, Carter's central arguments. That single fact shows, at least to my mind, that Israel's American defenders know full well that they cannot muster a single rational argument against Carter's account of what he calls Israel's apartheid policies in the West Bank. The facts speak for themselves, as Carter says. Israel maintains two separate road systems in the West Bank, one for the territory's immigrant Jewish population and one for its indigenous non-Jewish, that is, Palestinian population. The roads designated for Jews are well-maintained, well-lit, continuous, and uninterrupted. They tie the network of illegal Jewish settlements to each other and to Israel. The roads for the West Bank's non-Jews, by contrast, are poorly maintained when they're maintained at all. They often consist of little more than donkey tracks in the, in the hillsides. They are continuously blockaded and interrupted. A grid of checkpoints and roadblocks, over 500 at last count, strangles the circulation of the West Bank's non-Jewish population, but is designed precisely to facilitate the movement of Jewish settlers. The West Bank's Jews are allowed to drive their own vehicles on roads set aside for them. The West Bank's non-Jews are not allowed to drive their own vehicles outside their own towns, each of which is encircled with blockades. A regime of curfews and closures enforced by the Israeli army, has shattered the non-Jewish, that is to say, Palestinian economy. None of its provisions apply to Jewish residents of the occupied territories. It is, in short, utterly impossible to rationally resist the charge that there are two separate legal systems and two separate administrative systems for two populations unequally inhabiting the same piece of land, which is at least one of the vernacular definitions of apartheid. And of course, the massive wall that Israel has been constructing in the West Bank since 2003 makes visible in concrete and steel the outlines of the discriminatory regime that structures and defines everyday life in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, separating Palestinian farmers from crops, patients from hospitals, students and teachers from schools, and increasingly, parents from their children. In fact, the wall east of Jerusalem has separated one parent or another from spouses and children in one out of five families, uh, Palestinian families. All of this economic, political, social, and psychological damage is being inflicted on Palestinian communities in order to, to facilitate the freedom of movement of the Jewish settlers of the West Bank who live in settlements whose very existence is illegal and of ensuring their territorial contiguity with and ultimately probably their annexation to Israel. On this account, again, there can be no, dis no disputing the case, rationally anyway, for apartheid made by President Carter. The book's most obvious flaw, however, is that it restricts the discussion of apartheid to the West Bank, which Carter calls Palestine. In the book itself and in subsequent media appearances, President Carter has stubbornly insisted that the apartheid regime ends at the 1967 border that separates the West Bank from Israel proper, and he keeps insisting that Israel itself is a democracy in which all citizens enjoy equality before the law, the kind of thing reiterated in the little propaganda leaflet somebody was passing out which says Arab citizens of Israel have full rights, etc., etc. This is simply not true. Consider, for example, the city that Israel considers the, set, the eternal capital of the Jewish people. When Israel illegally annexed East Jerusalem following its capture in the 1967 war, it redrew the city's municipal boundaries in order to increase Jerusalem's size by adding more territory to it. Almost all of what Israel considers East Jerusalem today actually consists of land that used to belong to West Bank towns like El Bire and Bethlehem. The problem for Israelis is that they, as, as they expanded the, the borders of Jerusalem, the problem was that no matter how they drew the borders, they ended up absorbing 
too many, what they thought was too many Palestinians. So because what they really wanted was the land rather than the people, as usual. And they ended up with tens of thousands of additional Palestinians inside the redrawn borders of, of Jerusalem. Since then, it has been the official policy of Jerusalem city planners to try to hold the population of Jerusalem in a ratio of 72% Jews to 28% non-Jews. This is official policy. I do not know of any comparable policy anywhere else on the planet. In fact, even in history, as far as I know. The point here is not that Israel's official aim seeks to match policy to reality. It is, on the contrary, that it holds a reality hostage to a blatantly ideological policy. In order to make real life, that is, real families, real people, real communities, match up to this ideological abstraction, then Israel has done everything possible to limit the growth of the non-Jewish, that is, Palestinian population of Jerusalem, while encouraging the unfettered growth of the city's Jewish population, principally by expropriating land from non-Jews and using it to build housing for Jews, which is, of course, a violation of international law. While Israel has been rushing to build new settlements inside Jerusalem, it has systematically been denying building permits to Palestinian families, demolishing the homes they build illegally as a result, and wherever possible, stripping Jerusalem-born Palestinians of their Jerusalem residency papers, which means, in effect, summarily expelling them from the city of their birth and denying them the right to ever enter that city again, because, as you know, Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza are not allowed, have not been allowed in Jerusalem since since the signing of the Oslo Accords, actually since before that, in fact, in 1993. At the same time, of course, they're allowing, in fact, they're greatly encouraging Jewish immigrants from Moldova and Brooklyn and other places who have never set eyes on the holy city to live there in place of the Palestinians who are being removed from it. You don't have to take my word for the extent of the discrimination in Jerusalem city planning. Here is the city's revered former mayor, Teddy Kolek, who died recently, in response to an interviewer who, had, who was congratulating him for having done so much for the non-Jewish population of Jerusalem. And I quote from Teddy Kolek, what have I done? Nonsense, he said, fairy tales. The mayor nurtured nothing and built nothing for the Arabs. For Jewish Jerusalem, I did something in the last 25 years. For East Jerusalem, nothing. What did I do? Nothing. Sidewalks? Nothing. Cultural institutions? Not one. Yes, we installed a sewage system for them and we improved their water supply. Do you know why? Do you think it was for their own good or for their welfare? Forget it. There were some cases of cholera there and the Jews were afraid that they would catch it so we installed sewerage and a water system for the Arabs. That's Teddy Kolek. And if this is the case in Jerusalem, then one should be, hardly be surprised to discover that the same forms of discrimination pervade Israel itself through and through at all levels of life with an obvious impact. If, as Ahmad Tibi once pointed out, Israel is indeed a Jewish and democratic state, it is so only to the extent that it is democratic for Jews and Jewish for Arabs. Israel is uniquely not the state of its actual citizens, but rather the state of the Jewish people. Its laws explicitly privilege foreign Jews over native-born non-Jewish citizens. I'm talking about Israel, not the occupied territories, even Israel proper. In fact, because Israeli law does not acknowledge a distinction between being Israeli and being Jewish, not all Israeli citizens, Arabs and Jews, officially share the same nationality. In official Israeli records, for example, the nationality of a Jewish citizen of the state is recorded as Jewish, the nationality. The nationality of an Arab citizen of the state is recorded as Arab. There is, according to the state of Israel, no such thing as an Israeli nationality as such. The Israeli Supreme Court, when it was challenged on this question, decreed that, quote, there is no Israeli nation separate from the Jewish people, unquote. Now, if there is no legal distinction between being Israeli and being Jewish, someone who is a citizen of Israel but who is not Jewish obviously faces a profoundly ambiguous situation. And indeed, there can be little wonder that more and more Israeli Jews, now led by the Moldovan immigrant, former nightclub bouncer, and, and current deputy prime minister of Israel, Avigdor Lieberman, who, who want to expel the country's Palestinian minority and have done with it. At least he's, at least he's honest, though. Pending such a final solution to what is openly discussed as the demographic problem, whole layers of discrimination are woven directly into the fabric of Israeli law, institutionalizing the differential treatment meted out to Jewish and non-Jewish citizens of the state. 
In matters of education, health care, and housing, for example, Israel's Palestinian citizens face formidable difficulties for the simple reason that they are not Jewish. There are massive disparities between Jews and non-Jews in access to educational and health care facilities, and, as we found out last summer, even in access to bomb shelters. Schools for Jewish children receive nearly six times the amount of funding per student than schools for non-Jewish children in Israel. The infrastructure and facilities, including facilities for either gifted children or kids with special needs at schools for non-Jewish citizens, are far below those available for schools catering to Jewish children. Moreover, the Israeli government offers academic assistance and counseling and so forth for newly arrived Jewish immigrants, but not for needy indigenous Palestinians. These forms of institutionalized discrimination are built directly into the Israeli university system, which is one of the justifications for the calls for international boycott, an, an academic boycott of Israel. Non-Jewish students face formidable difficulties in even getting admission to universities in Israel, where Hebrew is the main language of instruction. Arabic is taught as a foreign language. Despite Palestinian families' famous devotion to their children's education, Palestinian citizens of the state constitute fewer than 10% of undergraduate uh, students and about 3% of doctoral students in Israel, and only about 1% of lecturers at Israeli universities are Palestinian. Similar patterns of repression and discrimination are built into Israel's housing and, and land policies. Well over 90% of the state, uh, state's land, stripped from its former non-Jewish owners, is held in trust, not for the state's citizens collectively, but rather for the Jewish people, wherever they are, and cannot legally be sold or even rented to non-Jews. Most astonishing, perhaps, and I'll close with this, is the case of those Palestinians to whom Israeli law applies the oxymoronic designation present absentee, and the so-called unrecognized villages presently inhabited by many of these wretched people who today number in the tens of thousands and are a significant component of Israel's Palestinian minority. An unrecognized village is a Palestinian community that is completely invisible to Israeli administration and planning documents, even though, like the present absentees themselves, it physically exists. Israel does not, however, acknowledge its existence, or rather, like Melville's character, Bartleby the Scrivener, it would prefer not to. And therefore, these unrecognized towns and villages do not receive any government services. They don't exist, officially, you see. No electricity, no water, no schools, no clinics, no mail, no nothing. They literally do not exist as far as the state is concerned. They are invisible. Moreover, because the towns do not officially exist, their houses are all built without permits, even though they were built actually before the founding of the state in many cases. Therefore, the houses are all liable to demolition and the people to expulsion. There are hundreds of these villages, of which the best known is the community of present absentees near the town of Ein Hod, the celebrated artist's colony where two generations of Israeli artists have been seeking inspiration from what they consider the primitive aesthetic of the stolen houses that they live in within eyesight of their real owners, the present absentees, dispossessed, brutalized, dis denied essential services for the simple fact that they are non-Jews cluttering the space of the state that wants so desperately to be Jewish but is not. As one resident of the new Ein Hod puts it, quote, not providing you with electricity or water or roads ensures that nobody can see you. It's a way of erasing you. This, of course, reminds us of the limits of the apartheid analogy in describing Israel and Palestine. In South Africa, apartheid was a system of dealing with a troublesome native population, regulating it, controlling it, etc., but that involved recognizing the population for what it was, perhaps even exploiting it for its labor power. Israel has appropriated many of the same schemes that the South African planners developed, like the policy of Bantustans, the policy of developing past systems so that people can't live together, and so forth. But Israel also desperately wants to pretend that it is a Jewish state, which it is not, because half the population over whom Israel rules is not Jewish. So alongside the blatantly racist policies, there is also a willful blindness in Israel, exemplified by the case of the unrecognized Palestinian villages. Israel doesn't just want to control the Palestinian population the way apartheid did in South Africa. It wants to blot it out, to cover it up, or to remove it entirely. Leading Israeli politicians, including the Deputy Prime Minister, speak about this every single day. It is this willful blindness that allows Israelis and their well-meaning American supporters, including many members of the Jewish community in the U.S., which has such an exemplary record of refusing discrimination and fighting injustice, to shut their eyes to the reality of what Israel is doing and has been doing to the Palestinians. Such blindness 
accompanied by their invisibility to the worldwide media, makes it much more difficult to compare Israeli policies with South Africa's. At least the South Africans had the courage to give their system a name. Whereas the Israelis continue to deny to themselves, above all, that they've done or are doing anything wrong. This is, of course, what allows them to build something that in all seriousness and with the greatest moral gravity calls itself the Museum of Tolerance on an ethnically cleansed site in central Jerusalem where the cries of the victims are still audible, at least to those who can hear them. Thank you. So I'd like to thank our panel again on behalf of the organizers of Israel Apartheid Week. And before I open up um, for discussion, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. One is that in two weeks, we will be having a citywide meeting about boycott divestment sanctions campaigns. And the time and place will be announced on a listserv. If you're interested, there is um, a sign-up sheet going around, so please sign up your name. And also I wanted to remind folks that there is going to be another event tomorrow on digital resistance and Palestinian youth media here at um, the NYU School of Law at 7 p.m. And so all of that information is available in the back. I think we're going to be taking three or four questions at a time. And I'd like to ask again um, that people are respectful. I know that there's a lot of debate that's going to be happening and um, you know I just want to insist that we're all respectful and that we actually have a discussion um, and there will be mics going around right there okay um, to go ahead up here in the blue thank you. okay thank you um, I want to thank you uh, for speaking and for your opinions um, but I kind of find it um, a little offensive as just a human being uh, to compare uh, what happened in South Africa um, without uh, your African brethren here in the room, you know, one or two individuals, um, but the, the practices of what happened in South Africa and to discuss that uh, and to compare that to what's going on in Israel where uh, the Palestinians have their own government um, and make decisions on their own populace. And no, I'm not, I'm not saying that what, anything that Israel does is perfect, but neither, so, you know, there's no country that, but no, do in you, the world that everything does. Now. If you have a question, it would be good, then people can respond to okay, your so, question. Okay, um, so I'd actually like to ask uh, Ifat um, what you think, because I, I actually really respected what you had to say. Um, what do you feel about uh, the education system within the Palestinian territories um, about um, how they're educating their children to hate Israel and to hate Jews or the West? Um, and if you actually, anybody here can watch it online okay. at Palestinian Media Watch, they can see what they're indoctrinating the children, uh, whereas in Israel, the children are not being indoctrinated okay. to hate the Palestinians. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Other questions? Over here in the black. <clears throat> I had a little bit difficulty to speak in English, but I will try, and I want to answer you. Um, I grew up uh, as a settler. I'm coming from Itamar. In fact, I guess you know where is it. Um, I was a former member of CAF. Uh, I was in three operations against Palestinians. I was a soldier in uh, the, the, one of the best units in the Israeli army. And um, I believe that the one of the worst things is exactly what you think. Because for many people, they actually don't know what's going on inside the settlers. The majority of Israel, let's say in Tel Aviv or uh, in Jerusalem, are getting a good education. But, but the good education is 100% denial of uh, human rights. I was. I'm just 25, that means that just five years ago I was living in nearby Nablus. Um, for Palestinian neighbors, what they see as Israeli for them was either a soldier with a gun or a settler with a gun. I had two guns. I had a small gun and I have M16. When I wanted to go to Jerusalem, I had six, the road 60. I don't know if you guys know about this road, but it's a big, big road 
that you can be from Nablus to Jerusalem in 25 minutes. For Palestinian, and I'm not talking about Hamas or someone that wants to kill Israeli. This is another thing. Just a regular Palestinian couldn't go on this road. And for him to visit his family in Jerusalem took him four hours or three hours. And the meanwhile, when he tried to get to Jerusalem, he had, he had to cross four checkpoints. When I was as, as a soldier, I usually stop those people for half an hour or an hour to check their car. Yeah. If, thank you, thank you. But if you. Okay. Yeah. Can I. Um, I know that there's a lot to be discussed, but I'd like to ask specifically for clear, simple questions. I'd like to ask you to limit your questions to two to three minutes, please. I will cut you off if, if you go over. Um, okay. Go ahead, Aura. Yeah. Um, my question is first for Robert, but then I'm sure you, the rest of you will probably have really good thoughts on this. Um, often, not only is Palestinian resistance um, completely decontextualized and the history is erased from where it comes from and everything, but also it feels like a really big problem for us as activists in the solidarity movement is that um, we actually allow for, in our language and, um, and some kind of uh, along what you were saying about language, to actually allow our movement and our organizing to be politically ghettoized and not connected to and framed in a broader analysis of power and privilege and historical and geopolitical events. Um, so first for you, Robert, I, I feel like it's really important for us to go beyond just symbolic solidarity with indigenous struggles here on the land that we actually are a part of occupying. Um, but if you could actually help us understand or maybe speak a little bit about the current situation with indigenous struggles on this land and how, and then this is for all of you, how are there any ideas for how we can better build connections between the Palestine Solidarity Movement and indigenous struggles here, which I think unfortunately our connections on that level are woefully inadequate in the US, better in Canada, but how maybe we can build that stronger. Okay, great. I think, I think we'll just cut now for, and give Ifat and Robert and whoever else wants to respond a chance and then we can open it again. Hello. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, to answer your, your question about the, the education stuff, um, you know, that, that issue of, of, you know, reactionary teaching in any context, whether it's Palestinian kids or Israeli kids or here in the U.S., is, is troubling, certainly. Um, you know, and, and what came to mind when you were talking about that actually was this image that was circulating online last summer during the war of these two Israeli schoolgirls, I don't know if anybody else saw this, signing a message on one of the bombs that was being sent to Lebanon, and they looked like maybe, you know, nine, eight, ten years old. And, um, and you know, that, that kind of passing on of, of, of a culture of, of violence and hatred to, to the next generation, regardless of, you know, what side of the green line they're on, obviously is very destructive. What I think it's important to know, um, and I don't know if you're aware of this, is that certainly in, in the occupied territories, including, you know, in, in Gaza, which now everyone here just feel, you know, thinks of as like a hotbed, hotbed of Hamas and nothing else, but, the, but in, you know, in the occupied territories, there's a, a, a long and very formidable tradition of people who not only care deeply about about um, education and, and a kind of humanist education, but also about, about democracy and, and, and human rights and, and imparting those traditions to their kids. And those people are losing right now. And part of the reason that they're losing, a big part of the reason that they're losing, is because of the occupation and because of policies of the US, of Israel, of you know, generations of policies of you know, the US and, and one of my co-panelists talked about this a little bit, um, Israel being, being, in the, being, a, being used by the United States to um, destroy uh, Arab nationalism and progressive Arab movements in the Middle East, uh, including the kind of people who, you know, could show up at a school board meeting and say, no, this isn't going to fly, you know, the, the specific example that you're talking about. You know, we're, we're looking at a context that's been heavily shaped by U.S. and Israeli intervention, and, you know, the snapshot that you're seeing in the moment, I think it's very important to be able to look at that and to be able to, to, to bring history to what you're seeing. Otherwise, you're looking at a distortion. Robert, also, if you want to 
I, th I think the question was from this lady, how can we better build struggle, basically, was her question. Uh, of course, in any struggle, we must learn the history of not only our own struggle, but those of other struggles going on because they all interrelate. We're all dealing with the same colonizers. And one of the, I just want to refer back to the question of education because I think it's very important. And this young man down here has uh, raise that question, and I want to give another example uh, in terms of the colonization that has gone on in this country with Native American people, with Euro Americans that have invaded this country. As and the same thing, I'm sure, is happening with the Palestinian country because it's a common method of colonizing a people. It doesn't matter where it's taken place. It's going to pay, take place, I'm sure, in Iraq as soon as that is tied up. But one of the main things that a colonizer does and target, targets is to, is to take the children and institutionalize them into the mainstream culture. In this country, in the 16, 17, and 1800s, Native people, Native children, were virtually kidnapped from their families, taken hundreds of miles away, sometimes thousands of miles away, to government boarding schools, Catholics, Protestant schools, where they were stripped of their Native culture, forbidden to speak their language. It has happened with the Basque, it has happened with the Catalonians. And if given an opportunity, it will happen with the Palestinians because this is the nature of colonization. And this is what we need to understand. We need to understand the methodology and process of colonization if we are to understand how we are to struggle against those. Um, I, I try to explain as little as possible about my position, but the panel was not that balanced that it would be very easy for people who deviate from the mainstream to easily explain their points. And I, I think that language is quite important, and I agree, therefore, with the gist of what some people said. And the analogy of apartheid still doesn't make sense, even if some South African Jew might have thought this was appropriate. And the, basically it was outlined here what the problem is. The problem is that the concept of apartheid was more or less a concept of slavery. And the concept of the Jewish state is basically a concept of like being in this way, yes, apart, being separated as a nation, as every nation is separated from other nations, from other nations. So, do you have a question? Yeah, this was the, the dissent on the notion of apartheid that was at the stake of this discussion. My second question was on the first speaker, and like, please correct me if I'm wrong, but what I perceive from what you said is you very detailed explained that the global mainstream and media and all the nations consented on this two-state solution that was outlined in Oslo, and like the probably many versions of this, but what you had said at the very end, when you became more uh, strategist, policy-wise, you said that what we need to, or what the activists of your movement need to embark on at this point was that and we, we have to focus on the 67 borders because this is where we have leverage and this is what we can kind of, where we can push Israel back. Um, but you, you said that there was a longer-term perspective, and this longer-term perspective was probably what you would name like the binational solution for the state. And oh, correct me if I'm wrong. And the problem, like how this is perceived, and um, traditionally by Israelis or by 
people who sympathize with Israel is that this position basically tries to alleviate um, the state of Israel and says we don't want the okay. Jewish state. And Thank then you. the question would be, just ask the question because there are other people who need who want to start with Israel and Palestine and not with Mexico. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, can we have the person in red over there and then I have a question. Hi. Um, from your uh, definition of apartheid, it seems that uh, containment and uh, segregation are primary themes that uh, Israel continues to exploit. Uh, my question is, considering that Israel is an apartheid state, how would you defend the assertion that Israeli Arabs have the right to attend all public universities within Israel, and that there are even Muslim citizens who serve in the Israeli Supreme Court and Parliament? And it seems that many, many of you omitted the rights and privileges that um, Israeli Arabs have within uh, Israel and Israeli society. And from my perspective, okay. as a college student studying South Africa right now, this definition of apartheid now is not how apartheid was used then. Okay. Any questions? Any other questions? How about other gentlemen up here? Yeah. My question is, what ways, if any, are any of you aware of that the usage of the apartheid angle is not helpful in the support of the Palestinian struggle? Okay. And I, and I actually wanted to um, direct a question to both um, Bashir and Saudi about the relationship between um, apartheid, capitalism, and labor, because I know I've, um, you've written a, a bit about that, um, Bashir, and, I, and I, you know, I think it is drawing on this question interesting to start really getting into and thinking about this analogy and complicating it. So if you could touch on that. Um, let me take the, the first question about the two-state solution. I didn't hear your, your third question. I just heard the second question. So for, It was cut off. It's terrible. Let, let, me, let, me hear this, let me tackle the second question. My argument about uh, the 67 occupation of the West Bank and Gaza is an argument based on what the Palestinians can achieve now. I, let me be blatantly clear with you. If the Palestinians found the state in 67, in the West Bank and Gaza, this is not the end of the Palestinian question. The Palestinian question is fundamentally a refugee question. There are 400,000 refugees rotting away in Lebanon with no rights, not allowed to work, not allowed to work in 74 different kinds of jobs. This is the Palestinian question. My argument was actually an argument about political realism now, what you can do now, and where it's possible, where it's possible to affect, uh, to put pressure on Israel to begin a process of decolonizing all of Palestine. And by decolonizing all of Palestine, I mean ending any notion or sense of exclusive Jewish privileges for Jewish Israelis. So that we can get to a state at the end of it, at the end of the struggle, that would allow us to live with Jews without one group dominating the other. Whether it's in one state or divided up more, more justly, differently, that's a, that's a matter of struggle to be taken. But the end result is, if you're a humanist like our fellow here, who's worried about Palestinians being educated badly, not worried about the fact that they're shot at every time they go to school. The end result is, sit down. The end result is... The net, if you're a universalist, like I assume all of the panelists are, the end result is to remove any notion of exclusive rights for anybody. So to get to a state where you can share equally, you can be in a reciprocal relationship with somebody else and you can live in mutuality. That, I think, there is no, there is no argument 
on the panel over this, over the end result. The question is, the subject of argument is Palestinian strategy now, and what do we do now, and where do we put most pressure on Israel now? That's the subject of debate. Now, the second question, I don't want to take too much time, is about where the apartheid analogy is not helpful. I think now, where the apartheid analogy is not helpful, is to say politically that the Palestinians should go for a one-state solution now. I don't think this is on the historical cards now. I think the most that the Palestinians can, can achieve now, if they fight hard and long enough, and hard and long enough doesn't imply in the next couple of years, but probably for the next 10, 15 years, the most that they can achieve now is to decolonize the West Bank and Gaza. If, as a result of this process, we can come to a conversation and communication with Israeli society that they can end their privileges and live with us as equal, fabulous. Fabulous. There is no question that Israel is an exclusivist, racist state towards the Palestinians. There is no question about that. There is no argument on the panel about this. It's by definition, legally, a state not for its citizens but for the Jews. The question is, for us as activists, is how do you get there? How do you get to the universal in Palestine? And that can only be achieved with Israeli Jewish consent. This is a, a mutual project between the Palestinians and the Israelis when we come to de-Zionizing Palestine because we have to live with the outcome together as equals. Right? So the question is what to do now. I will end here and then maybe I'll pick up the apartheid and labor thing. I, I've, I've just been thinking more about these the sort of I mean, there's some genuine questions like the one about apartheid just now, but obviously there's a whole bunch of, uh, should we say, not entirely genuine questions. Um, and I think the interesting thing to my mind as somebody who, who teaches at a university is uh, the, the, my concern actually has to do with the education of American students, not so much with Palestinians and Israelis since I teach at an American university. And the, the astonishing thing to me is somebody who's been involved in the Palestinian struggle for justice for, I don't know, 20 years or more at this point, is that the kinds of things that campus youth movements like yourselves were saying when I was a college kid are exactly the same things you're saying now. So history has changed, the world has changed, new histories have come out, new narratives have been discovered, and yet, as this document shows, the, the line remains exactly the same as though nothing has happened. So to my mind, the most e extraordinary thing is, is the ability of some people to persist with repeating the same thing over and over and over and over again, like a kind of mantra, as though if you say it enough, suddenly the world will change. The, and the news I have for those of you who are inclined to this worldview is that that's not how the world works, actually. And you may convince yourselves of the the justice of your own position and of the rightness of your arguments, even though something like this contains no actual argument, recognizable as such to an academic anyway. And the, the, the point is that the rest of the world is actually moving on. So in fact, the, the, the thing is, despite, for example, the mass demonization, not mass, sorry, the, the, the attempted demonization of President Carter, his book is actually doing very well. He's achieved a level of visibility for the Palestinian question that many other people haven't been able to achieve. And in the end, as I teach my freshmen, an ad hominem attack actually doesn't work very effectively. If you want to engage, you should try to engage with the argument that the person is trying to make, not with who the person is, and not to raise extraneous points like this thing does, where it says more Muslims kill each other than Jews kill Muslims, or the real problem is in Darfur, not in Israel, or whatever. I mean, these are, these are totally extraneous things. So, of course, the difficulty here is that there is no argument. That's why I haven't heard anybody say, but there aren't really two road systems in the West Bank, because there are. Uh, nobody said, but there aren't two legal systems in Israel, because there are. Okay, we had the guy in the back who said, oh, but there are Arab citizens have all the rights that everybody has, and I just finished telling you, according to the state of Israel itself, there is no such thing as an Israeli nation. It doesn't exist as such. That is to say, the Israeli Supreme Court itself says that there is no distinction between being Jewish and being Israeli. So how can you then tell me that an Arab citizen of Israel has the same rights as a Jewish citizen of Israel? I mean, what you're telling me is something that the Supreme Court of Israel itself has said is not the case. So, 
I mean, I, the, there are other questions to say here, but I mean, the, the point I'm trying to make is that it's time for people to actually engage in arguments, not to raise externalities, not to raise nonsense. It just doesn't work. People are no longer listening to you. That's the main lesson you should go home with. So um, before we open again, you guys actually didn't answer my question, which was <laughs> a genuine question um, about labor, apartheid, differences, South Africa, Palestine. Let me just say very briefly, the main difference between um, the Israeli case uh, in its relationship to the Palestinians and uh, the South African case is that the, Palest the, the South Africans were actually incorporated into the, the, the South African regime and the fact of their incorporation as labor, the fact that they were exploited, meant that they could exert pressure on the South African entity in ways in which the Palestinians tried in the first intifada and as a result of which were cut out of it. So it's much more difficult for the Palestinians to uh, get to the same outcome that uh, we had in South Africa, exactly because there's a problem of leverage. So it, it has nothing to do with whether the Palestinians have a national charter like ANC or don't. It has to do with the material conditions on the ground. The material conditions on the ground are very different than they are in South Africa, which is why to tackle the issue of Israel, the nature of Israel, the racist nature of Israel, the Palestinians on themselves lack the capacity now to do it. They might need help from Arabs, they might need international support. To be able to trust, they might need more Israeli support. In and of themselves, they're not in a social, economic position within Israel to affect that. So that's the limitations of the apartheid. I think the strength of the apartheid is exactly to emphasize segregation, exactly to emphasize that there's fundamental inequality between nations, and the moral purchase of the word, the word apartheid is very important. People associate apartheid with a racist regime. This is what we have in Israel, absolutely. But we don't have to go for the same outcomes at the moment right now. That's my only 10 pence thought. Yeah, I think one other place where the uh, apartheid analogy is going to break down, I think it's a good analogy for, f for describing the conditions on the ground, as, as you're saying. Um, but I don't think it's going to take us that far forward into the future because of the, the very real differences between Israel, Palestine, and South Africa. What's going to have to happen in Israel if, if that country reaches a point of being able to, to based on the kind of pressure that's going to need to be applied because people don't tend to give up those kinds of privileges without political pressure. Um, once we're at that point, you know, what's going to have to happen in Israel is that people are going to have to reconceive the very nature of the state. And I don't think that that's a project that South Africa had to take on in the same way. Um, and there aren't a lot of models for that. In a way, it's a very, very exciting prospect. and and. You know, you could imagine kind of like in that moment in South Africa, you know, at the end of the 90s when there was however many challenges and struggles there were and hardships, it was like an incredibly exciting, you know, moment just because of the newness of it all. And you could kind of, if you're feeling very hopeful, imagine such a thing in Israel. But it's all going to have to happen, you know, not, it's going to be very uncharted waters and people are going to have to reconceptualize their relationship to the state, not on the basis of, of, you know, ethnicity and religion, but on the basis of, you know, citizenship, a wild, crazy concept. Um, you know, in that country anyway. So, you know, it's not that there's not models for it, you know, here in Europe and lots of other places, but it's a very foreign concept there. And I don't know that the apartheid analogy is going to be that helpful at that point. I just have a couple of quick things to add on, on this question. I, I mean, Bashir pointed out that the big difference between South Africa and Israel is that so the South African system was set up to exploit black labor principally. So it needed to be able to extract that labor. Whereas, except for that brief interval in Israel, the, the whole point about the, 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 the design of this project was to, was to facilitate and create Hebrew labor. So, I mean, so there's a very, very different attitude towards labor in both Israel and, and, and South Africa, which is, a, which is a major thing. As for the question of apartheid itself as a discourse rather than as an actual set of policies, I'll, I'll point out to you that Ehud Olmert, the current Israeli prime minister, has said publicly, on at least two occasions that I know of, but, the, but anyway, he said publicly that, that his big concern is that the Palestinian 
discourse shift from one of national liberation to one of struggling for one man or one person, one vote. And for, for Olmert himself, he said that will be the moment Palestinians stop demanding a state of their own. In other words, a two-state solution, basically. The moment Palestinians stop doing that, Olmert himself says, and they start instead demanding civil rights, human rights, you know, the, the, the right to live as equal citizens in one polity, he said that would be a much more difficult struggle for Israel to contain and to resist. He said that would be a much cleaner struggle and a much more dangerous struggle for us, the Israelis. This is Olmert speaking. So I think the government of Israel realizes itself the danger of this discourse, which is partly why it's in such a rush to say that these bits and pieces of territory in the West Bank and Gaza or whatever constitute a state, which everybody in the world knows it's not a state, it's not ever going to be a state, at least not the way they want to have it set up. So, that, so it's important to point out the, the, to separate, I think, the, the discourse of apartheid from an actual analysis of policies and so forth, and they're, they're separate things. And moreover, to point out, especially to our comrades over here, that the, 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 the Palestinian demand that most worries, indeed terrifies the Israelis, is that we live together in one land as equal citizens. That scares the, the daylights out of them. They don't want that. So the biggest threat to the Zionist project in Israel or Palestine is the call for a democratic and secular state. They cannot abide that. If you ask them, why can't we have a democratic and secular state? You can be Jewish, we can be Muslim or Christian or Hindu or Buddhist or whatever. Everybody does his own thing. We all share the land, we have one government. That is anathema to the state of Israel, which I think is a very important point, which is precisely what Olmert said. The moment Palestinians start saying, why can't we live equally in justice and peace on the same land, that's the moment that Israel faces the real struggle. That's Olmert's own view of things, so you know, make of that what you will. Um, so I'd like to please join me in, in, in thanking our panel once again. And And I would like to say that I think there are two sets of conversations um, going on in this room. And one set that I hope will continue all week long is a strategy uh, set of questions about what are the kinds of things and um, positions we can work for in the future, in the short term, in the long term. There's a lively debate within the Palestine Solidarity Movement. And there is a lot of work to be done um, on solidarity with Native American movements and many other movements. So please join us this week and thank you very much.